before you ask what you're coming to him to talk about. So prayer is not an informational session to inform God. He says, I, I already know what you want to talk about. I just want to know, do you want to talk to me about it? Here is the key. Just because God knows something doesn't mean he will act on it. He has knowledge of everything, but some things he will not act on until there is relational communication with him about it. So his knowledge does not equal his action. I know what you need. I just want to know, do you want me or just do you want the meeting of the need? Prayer becomes an answer to that question. Jesus says, pray in this way, in verse nine. Pray like this. This is really not a prayer to be repeated word for word. It is really a framework, a guide for praying. This prayer is one of the most empty prayers prayed by people. Some of you didn't need to look at the screen, didn't need to look at your Bible, because you know this prayer. It's, it's been prayed since you were a child. He says, pray like this. In other words, follow this guide. Let, let this be a, a, a governing premise as to how you approach prayer. So it's, not, it's nothing wrong with repeating it, but he doesn't want just meaningless or what he called in verses five through eight, vain repetition, just talking because you memorized it. But he says you can use this as an outline, if you will, for communicating with God. Today we want to look at verse nine. That's all our time will allow for. For verse nine is pregnant with principles for prayer. First of all, our father, our Father, point, you are not an only child. It's not just your daddy, it's our father. Why does Jesus say when you approach me, you're approaching an our God and not just your God? Because you're not the only kid in the family. If you are a parent, and one of your children wants to act like they're your only kid, there's gonna be conflict not only with the other kids, but with daddy who has to equally relate to the whole family. So you can't be in a family of multiple people, multiple children, and function like you're the only child in it. It's our father, this is why God has said there are certain things he will not do for one of his children if they, if they are not connected to the rest of the family. So any unchurched, uninvolved Christian is blocking the father from answering their personal needs because they don't want to be related to the siblings. So that's why God wants every Christian to be a functional, ministering part of a local church, which the Bible calls the family of God, the household of faith. Scripture says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. All the one another's in Scripture, love one another, care for one another, support one another, connect, connect with one another, uh, assist one another, all these one another's in Scripture, because God says you will get more from daddy if I see you relating to your siblings. So church involvement has to do with father engagement. One father, many children. So it's our father who is in heaven, not just your daddy. But he is father. He is father. Let's talk about that. You only have a father because you got kids. That's what makes you a father. Everybody who has accepted Christ, John 1, 12, has been made a son or a child or daughter of God. So you have a father. So when you approach God in prayer, he wants you to approach him relationally. Not just God, way up there, but daddy. 
up in here. He wants a relational communication as a father. Now the problem is, many of us have had a bad relationship with father. Some of you have had no fathers. Others of you might as well have had no fathers because he was there and not there. Others have had bad fathers or abusive fathers. And the temptation is to start with the father on earth and let him define your view of the father in heaven. So you, if you had a bad deal with the father on earth, it may have colored your view of your heavenly father. But the idea is to start with the father up there and let him define fatherhood down here. So for all you men who happen to be fathers, let's find out what the father is like so you and I can know the kind of father you're supposed to be. First of all, he is father by position because in the scripture, the father was the head of the home. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the breakdown of the father. God always did his covenants through the father because the father held the post of responsibility. So if you are a man here, God holds you in ultimate place of responsibility for your home by position and for your children. Maybe you didn't know that, but every man here needs to know in the Bible, it is the father's responsibility to raise the children, not the mother. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, fathers raise your children. It is not the mother's job to raise the children. It is the father's job to raise the children. The job of the mother is to help and fill in the gaps when the father can't be there because that is your role. The Bible tells the fathers to teach their sons. The Bible gives the father the responsibility. So if the father doesn't own it, you may be father by title, but you're not father by position because you're not carrying out the rearing responsibility that belongs ultimately, certainly with the help of the wife, but ultimately belongs in the hands of the man. So if you were the devil, what would you do? Get rid of fathers out of the home because by getting rid of the father, you've canceled the position, created an extra burden on the mother, and perhaps damaged the kids. So the devil has gotten fathers away so that people can be messed up about what our heavenly father really looks like. So there is a position to be held. The beautiful thing is if we start with our heavenly father, he takes responsibility for all of his children and for all of us who name the name of Jesus Christ. He owns that. God owns that because that's what fathers do. In addition to that position of raising the children, his job is to provide. God told Adam before he gave him a family, I'm going to make you a provider and I'm going to provide for you. So I'm going to provide for you so that you can provide for them because I'm your daddy. I want you to be their daddy. In addition to the position and the provider was the protection. He says, you are to guard the garden. And if you guard the garden under me, I'm going to guard you. I'll guard you while you guard the garden and you cover the family. So it was the God fathering Adam. Adam was to father the family and Adam was to get his clues of fathering from God. If you start with your human father and your human father wasn't a father worth following and you transfer that to God, you have a bad attitude toward God because you had a bad situation with your human father. So you're not an only child, but you do have a father and he says, you start your prayer recognizing that there is this relational connection with God. Even in ministry, I am pastor by position, but Paul says that your role in 1 Timothy is to father the flock. So I don't, I'm not just to occupy a position, but I am to father the lives of those who he has placed under me, under our pastoral staff, to father, that is to care for your well-being because that's what fathers do. They don't just show up to eat, they show up to care. And so our heavenly father has a position, he is a provider, he is a protector, and that's who you talk to when you pray. Our father. Second thing you need to know is our father 
who art in heaven. Translation, our father who's not on earth. Your father is a heavenly father. Now, this is critical because you and I live on earth and on earth we operate by our five senses and we are limited by time and space because we're earthbound. Let me tell you something about your daddy. Your daddy is not subject to the limitations of time and space because your daddy's house is in heaven. Daniel 4.26 says, heaven rules over earth. So what you need to know when you pray to your unseen father is that he's very much operative, he's in heaven, and heaven overrules earth. So therefore, the limitations of your earthly father are not the limitations of your heavenly father because your earthly father is as bound to earth as you are, but your heavenly father is not. Therefore, if you put all of your marbles on your earthly father with their limitations, you're going to miss out on the potency of your heavenly father who is not subject to this world order. I'm glad to know that earthly fathers don't have the last word. So if you were raised without a father, if you were raised with an abusive father, if you were raised with a neglected father, I want you to know right now that that earthly father doesn't have the last say so over your life, over your recovery, over your stability, over your provision, because your daddy got a daddy who is in heaven. That is, he operates out of a whole different realm. Now, when Jesus was on earth, he prayed to God as his father. Every time Jesus prayed, he prayed relationally. In fact, the only time that I've seen in scripture where Jesus prayed and called his father God was when he died on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Every other time, he calls him Father. The reason he has to call him God on the cross is he's covered with our sin. So there's no fellowship with the Father. So he got to have him way out there as the transcendent God. But when he was walking on earth, he called him Father. This is why I love John chapter 20, verse 17. Because John verse 20, chapter 20, verse 17 says, he tells his disciples, I am going to my father. He's getting ready to leave earth and go to heaven. I am going to my father, but then he says, and yours. Ooh, wait a minute. I'm not only going to my daddy, I'm going to your daddy too. Now, why do you need to know that? You need to know that because what Jesus was telling them that he's telling us is the same help that my daddy gave me when I'm on earth, now that I'm leaving, he makes available to you because you're as much of his kid as I am. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is seated on the right hand of the Father in heaven. And guess what it says in Ephesians chapter two, verse six? We are seated with him. So the same level of intimacy based on God's will that he had with Jesus, he says he wants to have with you if you relate to him as daddy. Some of us have gotten such bad teaching that we might as well be praying our judge who art in heaven because we walk around feeling this hammer over our head. That's what legalism does. It puts a hammer over your head. God is always out to get you. God is always out to judge you. Now, God does have a standard, but that's not the relationship he wants you to pursue. He wants you to pursue an intimate relationship with him so that you feel, sense, and experience his love, not his discipline, because good fathers do discipline. So it's our father. He is your father. Now, you're going to have to grow into this. You're going to you're gonna have to grow into this. But when you do, when you experience him on the father level, not the judge level, although he does judge, 
not the way out there level, talking King James English. You know, English you would never use in human discussion. Yet you get private with God, oh God. Oh, one who lives in the third heaven. Oh, one who put the stars in space. Okay, you don't talk to your daddy like that. Oh, father who goes to work every day. Oh, father who, who brings home the bacon. Oh, father, you don't talk to your daddy that way. Because that's stranger conversation. He wants to talk to one of his kids. Prayer is a kid talking to his dad. And now it becomes a conversation, not just this ethereal discussion. Our Father, who is in heaven, who operates out of that realm, but I'm praying because I need you in this realm. And then he comes to it. Here it is. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. The Greek word hallowed means to be sacred, separated, and unique. It's to treat as one of a kind. It's to treat as special, a class by itself. It's from one of the cognates of the word holy, to be separate, unique, special. Daddy, there's nobody like you. If you've... Uh, been around him for some time, from time to time, you hear me talk about my dad. He's in a nursing home now and I fly up as often as I can, given everything else that's going on, to spend a few days with him in the nursing home. It's a joy for me to talk about my father. It's a joy to me to talk about my father because I know the price he paid for our family. My father dropped out of high school because my grandfather was not able to make ends meet. To help my father make, my, to help my grandfather make ends meet, he dropped out of school and then when he could, went back to night school so he could finish. When he had the four of us, he was a longshoreman working on the, on the, uh, in, in the Baltimore Harbor. And some weeks he wouldn't have work to do of loading and unloading boats. Sometimes it went on for months that they didn't call him for work. And so I remember now, if you were to go to the basement in the home that I grew up in, you'll see all of this stuff, old TVs, old radios, because to make ends meet, he would go down and he would try to fix the neighbor's radio or the neighbor's television to just get a few dollars so we could eat. As most of you know, I don't eat fish. Can't stand fish. But there's a reason I can't eat fish and don't eat fish. Because when my father didn't get work and couldn't make ends meet, even shining people's shoes, he would go fishing. And he would go out and take a net and catch herring. Now herring are little fish with a billion bones. Okay? He would catch herring by the hundreds. We had herring and eggs for breakfast. Herring mayonnaise sandwiches for lunch. Herring and greens for dinner. And herring and ice cream for dessert. I mean, we got overwhelmed with Harry. I hate fish. <laughs> because for some reason, that thing created a negative thing. But my point is, he would do whatever he had to do for his family. He wouldn't give excuses. He wouldn't say it's tough out here. He wouldn't blame racism. All of those things were real. But he had a responsibility to take care of his family. And so when it comes to earth, I hallowed be his name. I celebrate his name. And there is no inconvenience 
There is nothing I'm not willing to do that I'm able to do because I know the price he paid. When you know the price God paid for your salvation, for your deliverance, it shouldn't be a problem hollowing his name. That means to put it in a class by itself. He's not to be treated like just a, another deity or just another greater. No, you are diminishing his name. That's why the third commandment says, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. That means don't not hallow his name. Don't treat his name as ordinary. Don't treat his name as something regular. We're dealing with super unlettered here, not regular. What does it mean to not hollow his name, that is, to treat his name in vain. There's a lot of ways you can do that. Comedians do it by profaning his name. They will put his name or Jesus' name at the end or at the beginning of cuss words or of evil, and they profane his name. They take the great name of God and they desecrate it. That's not to hollow his name. Or Maybe it's not something that radical. Maybe you knew you were lying, but you said, so help me God. So you used his name to back up your lie or your deception. It's bad enough you lied, but to put his name on it. That's why when you go to court, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Now, why do they make you do that? Because what they're saying is, if you're going to lie, after having put your name with God's name, you have perjured yourself. Because once you do that now, once you bring God's name into it, you shouldn't be lying attached to it. That's how serious, in principle, they use the hand on the Bible and the so help you God. Because you can profane his name. The word vain means empty, with no real reason. They're, they're, you're just throwing it out and not recognizing the significance of it. Okay, I've said this before, but to understand this idea of hollowing, making it sacred, treating it like it's, like it's unique. I, um, in light of what's happening in our home with Sister Evans and everything, I've had to learn to do dishes. For 50 years, I've not done dishes, okay? Now, I had other responsibilities, you know, the trash, cleaning the bathrooms, I, got, I had my tasks, but dishes was never one of them. So I never, I never had to do dishes, but now I gotta do dishes. So I'm trying to figure this out. I've gotten instruction, but I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out. Now there's a dishwasher, but that's too much like using a computer, so I ain't gonna fool with that. So there's a dish board, whatever this thing is that holds the dishes over here. And so I'm, I'm washing the dishes, you know, try to, the, the, my big problem is not making the water too hot, just trying to get it, get it just right. So, I, 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 so, so every day I'm washing dishes, okay? So I wash the dishes. Now the reason I'm washing the dishes is because the dishes in the sink are profane. They're dirty. Those are dirty dishes. That's the reason I'm washing them. When I wash the dishes, they are no longer, hopefully, profane. <laughs> and I've gotten the dirt off the dishes. Then the dishes, after they dry, have to be put up in the cabinet in the kitchen. Those are regular dishes. Those are the dishes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So they're profane if they're in the sink, because they're dirty. But now they're clean in the cupboard, but they're regular, because you use those all the time. But in this whole separate room, called the dining room, are the untouchables. <laughs> These are the dishes you better not touch. Unless it's a birthday, Christmas, anniversary, or you got special guests open, you don't touch those dishes. They are off limits. Why? Because those are special dishes accompanied by special silverware that is to be used for special purposes, those are holy dishes. Those dishes get their own room, own glass cabinet, 
You know, those dishes are not treated. You know, you know uh, the, the few times we get to use them, I, I tiptoe with them things. I, I, tip, I tiptoe with them things because those are hollow dishes. These dishes have been separated as unique. God certainly doesn't want to deal with the profane, but he doesn't want you treating him with the regular either. He wants you putting him in a class by himself. Now, we had some folks at first service. The only reason they were at first service is because the Cowboys playing at 12. I, t- I pointed them out. I pointed them out. I just pointed folk out who I knew was n- were not here ever at the early service. But when I found out the Cowboys was playing, because they hollowed their name. See, they treated them so special that they were willing to do something they don't normally do and get up for somebody that may or may not win. Even some of you here today who didn't skip service think you fooling me by having your phone low, (laughs) making me think you're reading along with me in scripture. But I know you don't have to read along with me because I'm just doing verse 9 and you just quoted it. So every time, every time you look down, I know what you're looking for. Because you hollow their name. Well, if you're going to hollow the name of somebody that may or may not win, may or may not be successful, what you think you ought to do for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is your daddy? We have all seen a dog being held hostage by a leash, by links in a chain that has it collared. And it can go a little distance, but once it goes too far, it's unable to go any further and many times are yanked back, unable to be freed because they have been collared by something that limits their movement. There are some here today who are being held hostage by unforgiveness. The links in the chain on the leash involve anger, bitterness, resentment, wrath, revenge, and all of these links hook into a collar called unforgiveness. This collar hooked onto this chain owns you. Perhaps it's been owning you for days or months, maybe years or decades. One thing is for certain, you're not able to get free. It's like the button in a tourist shop that read, the error is human to forgive. That ain't going to happen. A man was told to tell his enemy, Happy New Year. Wish your enemy Happy New Year. He went over and he says, I wish you Happy New Year. But only one. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul the Apostle says to forgive one another in verse 13. Forgiving each other. So let's clarify our definition. Stick with me today because whether you need help in this area or whether you know someone who does, and we probably all do, this is no small issue, as you will see. Forgiveness means to release a person from a debt or an obligation that has been incurred. It is the choice to release a person from a wrong committed against you. Forgiveness does not mean approving or excusing or justifying or pretending not to be hurt. It's not repressing it and pushing it in the basement of your mind so that you don't have to think about it. But it is releasing by choice someone from an obligation incurred 
to you because of wrong done against you. Everybody here has been on both sides of the equation. We have needed to be forgiven and we have needed to forgive. Everybody here, whether small or large, has been on the forgiveness continuum. And it is the quintessential issue of human relationships. Forgiveness is that decision to push a delete button because of a wrong done against you. Now let me clarify. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. It's a very important distinction. You can forgive people with whom you are not yet reconciled. Forgiveness, whether reconciliation occurs or not, is the decision of the offended party to release the party that has done them wrong, whether or not we ever hook up again. Whether or not we ever become friends again, whether or not we ever do business together again whether or not we hang out with each other again that is a goal that is a a need that may be something you strive to that may or may not happen but that does not determine whether forgiveness has occurred so please do not make the two equal one can lead to the other but one is not the other you can forgive for that which has yet to be reconciled a Sunday school teacher asked the class, what does it take for you to obtain forgiveness for sin? What do you have to do to gain forgiveness for sin? One of the students raised his hand, I know what you must do to obtain forgiveness for sin. The teacher said, what? He said, sin. Because forgiveness assumes a wrong done. That is, an illegitimate evil that is detrimental to the person who is the offended party and who needs to be the forgiver to the person who has hurt them. Now let's clarify. Forgiveness can be either unilateral or forgiveness can also be transactional. Now let me explain what I mean. Unilateral is to go one way. Forgiving people who have not asked you to forgive them. You see, a lot of people are held hostage waiting for somebody to say, I'm sorry. But if they never say, I'm sorry and you don't forgive, you're held hostage by what they do or do not do. Or unilateral forgiveness is forgiving someone who is unable to ask you for it. Like someone who abused you but who is now dead. Then you're held hostage for the rest of your life. Because if you're waiting for a request, that's a request that can never come. Or maybe it's a person who hurt you, but you don't know where they are. They've relocated. They've, they've started a new life somewhere. You, don't, you can't locate them. So there is no way for there to be a transaction. That's unilateral forgiveness. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Without you ever saying anything, forgiveness was granted. But then there is transactional forgiveness. Transactional forgiveness is forgiveness that comes because a person has confessed and repented of the wrong done against you. There's a transaction occur. In other words, it's two ways. They have come and requested forgiveness and demonstrated repentance that they are indeed sorry. They've said the words, followed up by the action, which now opens up the door for reconciliation. Reconciliation can occur when there has been transactional forgiveness that takes place. When there is no transactional forgiveness, it's merely unilateral forgiveness 
then reconciliation is difficult or impossible. That's why to restore a relationship, the Bible says that Jesus paid the sins of the whole world. That was unilateral, but he's offering transactional. Because if you come to Christ in faith, you will be reconciled with the Father. The Father's already reconciled with you through the forgiveness of sins. But when the transaction occurs, because you come to Jesus Christ, then reconciliation with the Father can occur. So let's get this straight. Forgiveness is releasing a debt, whether unilaterally or whether transactionally. But the transactional forgiveness gives a higher potential for reconciliation depending on what the infraction was and the time needed to get over the hurt or the pain that was caused by the infraction. I remember a man who ran into my car. He hit my car. Come to find out he was uninsured. So he had no insurance to fix my car. I have a dent in my car caused by somebody else who was unable to fix the problem. I got my car fixed. Now, what I could have done was drive around with a dent in my car caused by somebody else being mad every day that they didn't fix it. Every time I go out and see that dent, that no good driver, that uninsured driver has messed up my car. Unfortunately, a lot of folks are living with dents on their soul. A dent on the soul. A soul that somebody has run into your life and put a dent there. And you're spending so much time being mad that they were uninsured. That they couldn't fix what they dented. That you're running around and living life with a dent. That if forgiveness took place, would have been repaired by you. But you can become so angry, vengeful, and bitter that you get used to a dent. And don't know how to live without it. Because every time you see that dent, it justifies your anger at the person who caused it. Forgiveness is releasing someone for an obligation because of an offense against you. Please notice he says, stay with me here, in verse 13, he says, forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. He says, what makes it possible to forgive is recognizing you have been forgiven. If you lose sight of the fact that you are forgiven, it will be much more difficult for you to forgive. And there will is nobody here who has not needed to be forgiven. Now, different strokes for different folks, but if you're here and you're saved, it's because God has forgiven you of your infraction against him. There is an inseparable link between forgiving and recognize you have been forgiven. Forgiveness is a beautiful word until you're the one that has to give it. Now we love the word when we need it. But the word becomes much more difficult when we are the ones that have to disperse the forgiveness because we are the wounded party. On the cross, God took the initiative to provide forgiveness before we ever requested it. For God demonstrated his love toward us that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He unilaterally forgave on the cross and he wants us to be forgivers. Stay with me here because I can feel the consternation. To refuse to forgive is to burn a bridge over which you yourself must cross. If not now, one day. 
There are some here today who are being held hostage by unforgiveness. And because of what happened to you, how it happened, who did it, the collar is around your neck and every time you try to go, boom, the devil drags you back. And he yanks the chain. You're not going anywhere. Because this collar of unforgiveness controls you. We're being held hostage in our emotions, in our circumstances, in our relationships. Because the enemy knows that if he can keep bringing this thing up, he can keep it rolling around like a record recorder in your mind. He can own you, control you, break down relationships, even that have nothing to do with the person, but you can't move forward in other legitimate relationships because of the hurt, the abuse, the pain, the stress, the struggle that was caused you. He says, I want you to forgive as you have been forgiven. When Jesus prays the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. You remember that? That's the Lord's Prayer. He says, after he says, Amen, verse 14 of Matthew 6, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. So watch this. Many of us are walking around out of fellowship with the father because of an unwillingness to forgive. If you have a refusal to forgive, you and God are not on the same page. You have blocked God's operation in your life. No matter how many prayers you pray, no matter how many Bibles you read, no how many church services you go to, refusal to forgive horizontally breaks down fellowship with God vertically because the vertical is tethered to the horizontal. Forgive just as your heavenly father has forgiven you. Jesus tells another story in Matthew 18. He's talking about forgiveness. Peter wants to know how many times, beginning in the verse around verse 21, how many times do you have to forgive somebody? Because I know some of you asking. Jesus says there was a man who owed a man millions of dollars and he could not pay. He said, have mercy on me. I can't pay. Because he was getting ready to be thrown and sold, he and his family into slavery. It says that the king had mercy on the man and did not require him to pay. In fact, he canceled the debt. So the man is now free from millions of dollars of debt. He now is walking in freedom and comes across a guy who owes him a couple thousand bucks. He grabs the guy who owes him a couple thousand bucks and says, where's my money? You owe me some money and you're not paying me. The man said, have mercy on me. I can't pay. I want to pay. I will pay. I can't do it now. Have mercy. He had him thrown in jail. Say, you pay me, your life's going to be miserable. It says one of the king's servants saw him do this. And went back to the king and told the king what he did. Says the king was furious and said, go get him. They went and they got him and he required payment. He says, I forgave you millions. You were not willing to release somebody who owed you thousands. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to Hold you hostage until you pay up. And then the story ends with this statement. And so shall your father do to you. Or as James 2.13 says, He that hath mercy will receive mercy. The one that doesn't show mercy will not receive mercy. I love the way Ephesians puts it. Ephesians talks about the same thing. And here's what Ephesians 4 verses 30 to 32 says. 
It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God and Christ forgave you. Here it is, here it is, here it is. When you forgive, you have just crossed over into the supernatural. Let me say it again. When you forgive... As difficult as it may be, you have just crossed over from the natural to the supernatural. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is no longer sad inside of you. See, a lot of us, the word grieve means to make sad. A lot of us are walking around with a sad Holy Ghost. And that's why we are sad people. A sad Holy Spirit. So we're sad in our souls. A sad Holy Spirit. That's why we are discouraged and depressed. Because the Holy Spirit is sad. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. How do you know the Holy Spirit is sad inside of you? Because you're walking around bitter. Because you're walking around thinking about, I'm going to get you. What goes around comes around. If you are walking around thinking that way, feeling that way, acting that way, here's another way you know the Holy Spirit is grieving inside of you because you are slandering the person that hurt you. In other words, you're taking that person's name and you are seeking any kind of damage you can do. That means that you're still hostage to a noose around your neck. And he says, it's a Holy Spirit issue. This man was a leper. Something so wrong that it messed up everything that was so right. And there was no cure. It was incurable. So he is both simultaneously a captain, a conqueror, and a castaway. Most importantly, leprosy is tied to something going wrong spiritually. This man with everything right has one thing wrong messing up all that is right. What is your leprosy? What is that one thing in your life that is messing up all the good stuff going for you? And maybe you're successful in your career or with your finances or with your educational achievements and maybe you can hand out a resume that is impressive, but there's that one thing that you dare not put on it. That was Naaman's reality. That was his scenario. He had the, the butt phrase, but he was a leper. The footnote on his life, affecting everything. Well, we're told in verse 2, that in one of his battles, he captured a little slave girl. She told Naaman's wife, if we could get your husband, my boss, down to Israel to the prophet, Elisha, I believe Elisha could change his leprosy situation. She was a little girl. She was a nobody in terms of her position in life and her age in life, but she knew somebody. She had a hookup and a connection that could change this man's world and this man's life. So Naaman goes to his boss, the king, and says, this little girl told my wife, who told me that I may be able to get my problem solved by the prophet in Israel. So the king, watch this, the king of Aram, verse 5 says, go now and I'm going to send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed, he took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothes, brought them to the king of Israel. And he says, I've sent Naaman, my servant, verse 6, to you that you may cure him of his leprosy. Well, wait a minute. That's not what the little girl said. The little girl said, there's a prophet in Israel that can cure his leprosy. Verse 9, so Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the house of Elisha. He knocks on Elisha's door. Uh-oh. 
verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. Houston, we have a problem. We, we have some issues going on here. And the issue is explained to us in verse 11. But Naaman was furious, ticked off, mad, and went away and said, Behold, I thought, I'm coming back to that. He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand, hocus pocus, over the place and cure the leprosy. The end of verse 12 says, he went away in a rage. Because he said, are not Abana and far part of the rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? Turned away, ticked off. It's called leaning to your own understanding. It's called throwing your human opinion at God. It's called pride. He said, Jordan's too dirty. Uh, let, me, let me tell you something. It's a bad idea to stay outside the ark just because dirty animals are going in it. It's, it's a bad idea when them nasty animals, two by two, are coming out. I ain't going in that ark. It's going to be stinky in there, animals in there, all that refuse in there. I ain't going in that. Okay, you're going to die. So his servant comes to him and says, verse 13, my father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, give him another million, give him this, give him that, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says, go wash and be clean? If he'd have given you something hard, you'd have gladly gone and done it. He'd give you something easy. And now you're going to fuss and cuss and get mad at the prophet, get mad at the church. You're just going to get mad because they didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. That's not the question. The question is, was what they told you God's word and God's will? That's the only question. So, verse 14, he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. Watch this. According to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Don't let your dignity keep you from solving your problem. Partial obedience will not bring full deliverance. In fact, it may bring no deliverance. Because he was not delivered until after that seventh time. He had to complete what God was asking him to do. A lot of times people get mad. They say, I tried. I did what God said. But when you dig down deep enough, they did a part of what God said. They obeyed him enough to feel better about it. But they did not go all the way and complete what he had asked them to do. Until obedience has been completed. You cannot expect a supernatural incursion into your circumstances to calm it, correct it, and reverse it to whatever level the sovereign will of God will allow for. You and I must stop arguing with God's word. His word is final. It is settled in heaven. And sometimes you won't like it. And sometimes you won't understand it. In fact, if you can read your doctor's prescription, he's not a real doctor. <laughs> but even though you can't fully read it, even though you don't fully understand it, you go to the pharmacist, you fulfill it, and you take it because you trust the one who gave it. We say, well, I don't understand. I don't understand, so I'm not going to do anything. 
so you stay sick. Because even though you may not understand God's prescription, it's his prescription. And he knows what's really wrong. But until you take the medicine, not take the prescription, hear the sermon, no, you must take the medicine that is full obedience to see the...